Top Bird Talk. Good morning, my name is Ramai Santhropala and I'm going to be speaking about shared decision making and how we involve patients in the increasingly complex conversations we have in the perioperative space. Thanks very much for this opportunity to speak at EPOM 2020. So I'm going to start by giving a little bit of context into my clinical life. I work at Guy's and St Thomas's Hospital NHS Foundation Trust. We're split across two sites and we're fairly conspicuous. So St Thomas's, which is labelled there with the yellow arrow, is right over the river from the House of the Parliament and Guy's is right next to the Shard. We're a busy London teaching hospital and we do 60,000 operations a year, cross-cutting across 15 surgical specialties, touching upon most of those that you would know with the exception of neurosurgery and hepatobiliary. I'm going to start with a typical case study that comes in through our doors, or virtual doors in this day and age. We've got an 80-year-old gentleman who's got 7 centimeter saccular abdominal aortic aneurysm. So 7 centimeters means he's above the operative threshold, and a saccular aneurysm, much different to its fusiform counterpart, means that it's more likely to rupture. And our vascular surgeons have deemed this gentleman suitable for endovascular repair. This gentleman's got a complex past medical history. He's had a myocardial infarction back in the 1970s, for which he was conservatively managed. He's got an ICD following an episode of monomorphic VT. And he's had a mitral valve annuloplasty following bacterial endocarditis in 2009. He's had two strokes, and they've been in the posterior right circulation. He's also had a subarachnoid secondary to a mycotic cerebellar aneurysm rupture. And that was failed call embolization, and he was deemed not suitable for neurosurgical intervention. He's got pulmonary fibrosis, of which we don't know the etiology. He's hypertensive, and he's got mixed anxiety and depression, which has been exacerbated by the recent pandemic lockdown. He's frail, and we measure that using the Edmonton Frailty Score, which our perioperative medicine for the oldest surgical patient, POPS team, use. And also the clinical frailty score, which most of us will become increasingly familiar with, especially following the COVID-19 pandemic. Objectively, he's got a mild cognitive deficit, but he does have capacity, and this is not thought to be clinically significant. And on investigations, he's iron deficiency, he's got regional wall abnormalities in the anterior chambers on his uh, recent echo, and he's got an impaired systolic function, estimated roughly at 25 to 30%. His BMP is raised at 4,000. At Guys and St. Thomas's, we use a number of risk prediction tools for 30-day mortality, and his SORT score comes out at 6.45%, and we also use the Torbay-based Kylar risk calculator, and that comes out at 5.01. In short, he's high risk. He stopped smoking when he had his myocardial infarction in 1974, and he lives alone on a ground floor maisonette. Prior to lockdown, he enjoyed eating lunch at his local cafe, which we thought was 200 yards away, and he's able to walk to the local shops with his niece. Since lockdown, he continues to wash and dress himself, does light housework, and his meals are delivered. He walks with a stick. He thinks his quality of life is good. So it takes us to the common question that most of us will ask. Do we operate or not on this gentleman? And I was lucky enough to publish this review article alongside my POPs colleague, Judith Partridge, who's also speaking at EPBOM, a geriatrician, um, a consultant geriatrician by background, and also Carrie McEwen, who's the chair of the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges and also a surgeon by background. In this article, we talk about the complexities of risk assessment in this patient, particularly where the evidence base isn't particularly there, and risk communication, but also importantly, how we involve patients in these healthcare conversations, and also some of the leadership structure around that. So who does decide whether we operate or not? This is where we have a spectrum of choice. So we could either decide that doctor knows best so we could follow a paternalistic model, or we could give this patient and his family a huge amount of information but not really support that decision-making process, consumer choice. And I would advocate we should take the middle road, which is a shared model. Before I continue about shared decision-making, I'm going to actually define what it is. And I think there's a lot of misconceptions, and I think it's important to do this. So this is a definition I like which is from the King's Fund in 2011. Clinicians and patients work together. Well, we know that. But actually, this is based on best clinical evidence and professional expertise. And the reason I I like this definition is it advocates that it doesn't strip us of professional autonomy. As a clinician, you can still only offer options that you feel are valid. 
But let's center these discussions on what's important to the patients, so their values and their beliefs. Around this needs to be a decision support counseling mechanism, but also a way for recording and communicating these informed choices with other healthcare professionals and importantly, the patient. So who is the team in shared decision making? I think a lot of the shared decision making work and certainly a lot of the evidence-based interventions are around the single consultation between a clinician and a patient, or in this case, it may be a patient and his family. And whilst this is really imperative, I think this doesn't really have a wide enough remit. We have to remember that patients have a team. We did 57 semi-structured interviews at Guy's and St. Thomas's of patients across two pathways. So the knee pathway, awaiting knee surgery or rather contemplating knee surgery, and those in the skin cancer pathways contemplating various levels of surgery. And what we found through this is that patients got sources of information from a variety um, of inputs. So family, friends, neighbors, people they knew that had surgery before, social media, internet, and then there was medical professionals. So we have to put our 20 minutes or 45 minutes with that patient into context with the wider remit of where that information is coming from. Shared decision making mandates true MDT working and there is always a preventive care team behind these decisions. At Guy's and St. Thomas's, we're lucky. We've got a team of hugely qualified surgeons doing quite innovative work. We've got a team of 100 adult consultant anaesthetists um, and we've got our POP service, our geriatrician-led um, preventive medicine service. So increasingly, we're working very closely together to deliver what we deem is the best care for these complex patients. But we also have to remember all the specialist nurses and our allied health professionals, and particularly physiotherapists, um, we found. In addition to this, there are concepts such as the managerial structure. So particularly implementing um, shared decision-making at Guy's and St. Thomas's, the middle managerial structure has been imperative, and actually we couldn't do this without their help. But overarching all of this is also a leadership structure, and I've been really lucky um, with the shared decision-making work, both at a national level and also implementing at Guy's and St. Thomas's, to have some great kind of um, facilitators in the form of our immediate past deputy chief exec, Dame Eileen Sills, who is passionate about patient experience and anything that improves it, but also the chair of the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges, Carrie McEwen, who, in addition to the patient benefits and the patient-facing benefits of shared decision-making, also sees it as the way that we can deliver sustainable healthcare, particularly as we're a publicly funded model in the UK. So why do shared decision-making? I know some of the levers that have been particularly helpful in the UK and also kind of locally at provider level has been that it moves us towards a value-based healthcare model. And this is true of preventive care in its widest remit as well. If we move towards outcomes, and particularly patient-reported outcomes, shared decision-making becomes an obvious choice. It improves the quality of the healthcare that we deliver, and it may help with fiscal challenges. We know that shared decision-making improves patient experience. This is data from the UK, the CQC Annual Inpatient Survey, which asks patients at various hospitals up and down the country where you were involved in decisions as much as you wanted to be. And in the last 10 or so years, you can see consistently only 50 to 60% of patients say they were, which shows that we've got huge room for improvement. Shared decision-making also improves patient outcomes. And I want to draw your attention to this fairly recent Cochrane review, which said the implementation of shared decision-making improves patients' knowledge, their confidence, their compliance to whatever decision they've gone with. But also, interestingly, Implementing shared decision-making seems to reduce the number of patients who proceed with major invasive surgery, and on the most recent report, that was up to 14%. It improves workforce experience, and those of you who will know this structure know that I'm talking about the quadruple aim. I personally got into shared decision-making because as a registrar or as a resident, I felt slightly uncomfortable sometimes on the morning of surgery as an anaesthetist counselling patients for major surgery. I often wondered how robust that informed consent process had been and if patients truly wanted to proceed um, in a fully informed manner. And we now have a name for it. It's called moral injury and it's when physicians act against what they think is ethically correct. 
I truly believe shared decision making actually improves your workforce experience. And there is some early data to suggest that as well. And it was something that I personally felt very passionate should go into our review that we published early this year. And the fourth pillar of the quadruple aim, cost effectiveness. Now, I've put a question mark because I don't think there's robust data here. But I think there are a number of smaller studies which show that shared decision making does reduce costs. What I think, though, is that it's like any innovation. There is going to be some upfront costs, and that will hopefully pay dividends down the road. But I think the underpinning philosophy of shared decision making is it improves quality. So I was going to talk a bit about the national and the international agenda for shared decision making. Within the UK, we have a number of national bodies advocating shared decision making. So NHS England and Innovation are putting together the Personalised Care Institute. And the very remit of the Personalised Care Institute is to involve patients increasingly in healthcare decisions and also move towards self-management. The National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, NICE, has set up the Shared Decision Making Collaborative and that's been running for several years. And I sit on it on behalf of the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges. The Academy of Medical Royal Colleges leads on a national arm of an international programme looking at SDM known as Choosing Wisely. So a few words on Choosing Wisely. So Choosing Wisely is an international initiative originated from America in 2012 and has now spread to 22 countries, of which I've listed a few that the UK initiative works closely with. Our UK initiative has moved somewhat in a different direction to the international partners in that we've asked for recommendations from all our medical societies and rural colleges, but we've really tried to emphasize high value care rather than looking for interventions which reduce the use of low value care. So Choosing Wisely was established in 2016 in the UK and like I said, a very heavy focus on SDM. Following the development of these recommendations, we moved on to really look at how we can implement shared decision making within the National Health Service. And a lot of our work has centered from a patient facing and also professional facing on the promotion of this simple acronym BRAN. So what are the benefits? What are the risks? What are the alternatives? And what if I do nothing? And we feel this acronym actually touches on the pertinent aspects of any consultation will naturally unlock shared decision making. So moving from the international and national focus, what can you do in your separate hospital provider sites? Well, I'm going to show you some of the work that we've been piloting at Guys and St. Thomas's. So I've been at Guys and St. Thomas's for two years now as a consultant. And one of the things that I realized in the complex institution that it is, is that to make to implement shared decision making in a very much standardized um, manner, I was going to need to get executive buy-in. I think anything that involves multiple directorates, it's, it's important to set up something that sit ab sits above all those directorates. I was lucky enough to uh, meet with Eileen Sills quite early on. And uh, as I said, she was enthusiastic about the concept and particularly because it um, underlie, underpins some of her values around patient experience. We set up a Choosing YZ steering group at GSTT and we put a call out to all clinical directorates to ask if they would like to be involved in pilot work. Three positively responded, the knee pathway, so that's the orthopedic surgeons, skin cancer at MDM, and also our preoperative medicine for the older surgical patient service, POPs. Underpinning that is patient and information and awareness campaign and also a staff campaign. So what did we do? Well, first of all, I think it's really important to understand your baseline shared decision making. And there's a number of tools out there, subjective and objective. There are challenges around the measurement of shared decision making, and I'll talk you through the protocol that we used. So we went with the SDMQ9, which is a paired questionnaire. So the clinician or healthcare professional seeing the patient fills out one, effectively self-reporting, and the patient fills out um, a patient-facing tool. Both touch on nine aspects of a consultation and they ask the user to rate out of six based on a Likert scale from completely agree to completely disagree. This is some early data from our orthopedic work. So this represents um, 26 consultations by ortho consultant orthopedic surgeons. And I've listed the nine aspects of the questionnaire to your right. The blue bar represents where 
the clinician completely agreed that those nine aspects were met. And the yellow bars represent where there was strong agreement. So as you can see, a huge amount of confidence amongst our consultant orthopedic surgeons that shared decision making is occurring already. If we move to the respective patient score, so this is a corresponding data for those consultations, again, blue bars represent completely agree and yellow bars represent strongly agree. Again, patients are very kind to us at Kaiser St. Thomas's and they feel that those aspects of the consultation are occurring, although arguably to a lesser degree than our um, clinician colleagues. If we move on to the POPs data, so they looked at data from their foundation trainees right up to consultant level alongside their nursing staff. And again, a huge amount of congruence that shared decision making is occurring already amongst the clinicians and patients. And whilst we believe that hopefully this is the case at Geisens and Thomas's and we do have a high baseline, I think it also brings into question some of the validity of the tool. This is a validated tool. But I think our conclusions are that we have a high level of clinician confidence that SDM is occurring and that we have a high level of patient satisfaction with the consultation. But I think we can't really say much more than that with respect to the quality of the individual um, questionnaire. The quality of shared decision making as a measurement tool is the real linchpin of measurement, I think. We also process mapped some of our pathways. So some of our pathways, you can imagine, are exceptionally complex. And this is one of our simple, in inverted commas, pathways. So it maps the knee pathway from seeing a, a, a GP perhaps with knee pain or functional knee problems through to surgery. The general practitioner or primary care doctor might refer directly to the surgeon or via our physiotherapy-led musculoskeletal assessment service. The surgeon and the patient may then decide surgery is appropriate or not. If it's deemed appropriate or something that we should explore, the patient then goes through our preoperative processes, which might go through our high-risk anesthesia services or perioperative medicine for the older surgical patient, POP services. It may go through most, so such as the vascular case I presented. Um, he would be a classic example, which would need joint MDM. Following that, almost invariably, virtually, the patient will decide with the patient, the surgeon will decide with the patient whether to proceed with surgery or not. Mapping these pathways made it really transparent to us that actually shared decision making is occurring quite late in the pathway, usually with the anaesthetist or the POPs clinician. And one of the intent interventions that we've put in place is to train up our physiotherapists in the brand methodology and also to empower them to actually help patients ask these questions when they do meet the surgeons. We also did stakeholder engagement, and this was a mixture of focus groups and also nominal group techniques. And some of the responses that we've got are listed here. So in conclusion, some comments were that actually standardizing shared decision making through a framework across the pathway would be really helpful because actually it's quite difficult sometimes to know what the precedent conversations have been with patients. And that some patients, some clinicians invariably feel the pressure of external targets such as our 18-week target in the UK. And also that they felt that there needs to be a greater amount of prepping and expectation management to really implement shared decision making in a formal way. Similarly, as I mentioned before, we did 57 patient interviews, semi-structured patient interview, and this was led by a brilliant patient and public involvement team. And some of the reflections that we got from that was that imbalance, power imbalance between clinicians and patients. So some patients felt that actually if the clinician initiated shared decision-making com um, conversations, they would engage, but actually it was really hard for them to start those conversations. Bran as a tool really got a lot of positive feedback and particularly patients asked for leaflets that they could use at home perhaps before their consultations. But they said however much they prepared at home, actually on the day they were always nervous and anxious and likely to forget aspects. So prompts on the day were really useful. Using all this, we developed a number of leaflets and this is the first of them. This is a tri-leaflet and it's presented in this manner just so that it allows you to really see the extent of the leaflet. But this is what we're starting to send out to our patients ahead of perioperative consultations and it focuses on the brand concept. On the flip side of the leaflet is an opportunity for patients to talk about or um, discuss at home with loved ones perhaps 
the brand from their understanding. So one thing we got from our patient engagement exercises is that patients really wanted somewhere to note down and jot down um, their queries and also their understanding ahead of the consultation. Because as I said, they may be nervous on the day. We also have implemented shared decision-making perioperative workshops. Um, We've just completed our third in March, just prior to the pandemic. And we've been really lucky. So most of the content of the workshop is largely interactive. It's mostly role play. And it's based on the methodology from making good decisions and collaboration, magic. But we do hold kind of plenary sessions just to get everyone engaged in those sessions. And we've been really lucky. We've had Professor Alf Collins from the Personalised Care Institute at NHS England come and speak. And we've also had Professor Angela Bader from Brigham and Women's at Harvard. These workshops have been really well received. So generally in attendance, still the majority are anaesthetists, but we do have surgeons, physicians, um, nurses and allied health professionals. And just to give an indication at our last workshop, we had 31 attendees, of which seven were surgeons. And unanimously across the board, across various aspects of SDM skills, the workshops have been shown to improve confidence. So the blue bars represent pre-workshop scores and the orange bars post-workshop scores. But the real richness is in the comments and the qualitative feedback. And I'll just give you a moment just to read this. I think what this shows is actually often we think that we're practicing shared decision making, but it may not be the case. We've supported the workshops with e-learning, and this is a package that we created at the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges in conjunction with the Winton Centre for Risk and Evidence Communication, and also the Australian Commission for Quality and Safety in Healthcare. It's two hours long, it's open access, anyone can access it internationally, you just need to create a login. And actually, we've had some very positive feedback from this. We also know that documentation is really important and it's part of the initial definition that I shared. So um, our POP service have implemented this brand tool into their clinic letters. And also at national level, we've developed this brand adjunct to consent, which essentially touches on the aspects of brand, but also takes patients through that shared decision and actually documents it. I think this is really pertinent in the UK because we have a UK law that's passed several years ago known as Montgomery, which really means that we're accountable to these discussions, particularly around material risks. And it's really important to A, involve patients, but also have some clear documentation of that process. So back to our difficult discussions. So as a reminder, we had an 80-year-old multimorbid, frail man who was considered for elective endovascular repair of his AAA. He feels he's got a good quality of life and he's keen to proceed with surgery. So what do we know about risk in the COVID era? Well, one of the most landmark studies is COVID surge, which was published a little under two weeks ago in The Lancet. And it showed some alarming figures about patients who underwent surgery with perioptive SARS-CoV-2 infection. It showed that the 30-day mortality was 24% and the post-operative pulmonary complication rate was 51%. And whilst there's a few nuances of this study which may need further discussion, I think what we can draw is that contracting COVID-19 perioptively increases your mortality and it puts you at high risk of pulmonary complications. And those particularly at high risk are are people such as this gentleman, over 70, male, ASA3, and undergoing major surgery. Based on various bits of evidence, a number of ethical frameworks have come into play. And this is one that was published in NIJM quite recently. Again, I'll give you a moment to process that. But it essentially says various aspects of how we can frame who goes forward with surgery and who doesn't makes for a really challenging read, actually, but still recommend it. Nationally, our Royal Colleges in the UK have come together with intensive care societies and published guidance around who goes forward with certain surgical services. So again, we've got frameworks not from just the ethical perspective, but also from the logistic aspect. But how do we decide decisions based on an individual basis, so based on the individual patient? Well, this is where I'd argue that brand comes into play. So if we just do a brand exercise on this 80-year-old gentleman, 
So what are the benefits? Well, we're hoping to reduce his risk of aneurysm rupture. Added benefits are his quality of life. We're not entirely sure that having surgery or not having surgery is going to have a significant effect and can argue what significant means on his life years or extension, but it may do on his quality of life. He's extremely anxious as a pre-morbid state, and now he thinks that he's got a ticking time bomb in his abdomen. Risks-wise, he's got the operative risks, so the standard operative risks of any endovascular repair, including the chance of having endo leaks and having to come back to hospital to repair those. He's a significant risk of peroptive morbidity, and this may be cardiovascular, respiratory, cerebrovascular, or cognitive. We've already discussed he's at increased risk of 30-day mortality, and he's got the additional risk should he contract SARS-CoV-2. Alternatives are that he may opt for conservative management and just say, you know, regular surveillance is fine of his aneurysm. But equally valid is that he says, you know, at 81 years old, that he'd actually like to just have do nothing, the do nothing approach, which is active supportive management. So he can just live with his aneurysm, but not, in a, not, be, um, not have regular surveillance. So I wanted to close with some take-home messages. So our 80-year-old gentleman is actually currently, as I stand here, having a best interest discussion with his family, our consultant anaesthetist involved, our consultant geriatrician involved, um, and also the consultant surgeon involved. So I'll let you know the outcome um, maybe at the live session. But if you really want to take shared decision-making forward in your organization, there are three steps that I think you can take. I think, first of all, learn a bit more about what it is. And like I said, we've got a free online module for that. To start within your organization, and I accept this is based on your organizational structure, but I definitely found executive buy-in really powerful tool, particularly when you're trying to um, implement across several directorates. I definitely think process mapping, perhaps one of your more simpler pathways, is really important. It shows you a lot of what you can do to both improve systemically what can be done to facilitate shared decision making. So, for example, to optimize those consultation lengths or optimize the chances that SDM will occur, but also measure your baseline. I do think the SDM Q9 doc does have its remit, but I think exciting things in the, on the horizon will be how we measure this, particularly looking at aspects such as patient experience and also physician well-being. I'd also say that the brand resources will be available from the Center of Peroptive Care website. So with that, I'll close my presentation and welcome questions in the future. Top Med Talk. Thanks for downloading Top Med Talk. Don't forget to subscribe via your podcatcher. Don't forget to check us out on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn and YouTube. And also, don't forget, Top Med Talk is the broadcasting arm of EdPom, evidence-based perioptive medicine. We'd love you to find out more about that. If you check out ebpom.org, you can find low prices on some of the conferences we're organizing around the world. Many of them are virtual and don't even involve you leaving your own home. Check out ebpom.org now.